Lights. Well, good evening and thank you everyone uh, for being with us tonight for our first uh, event. Um, so tonight's discussion is from LGBT IQA Plus Greens for our panel event where tonight we'll be discussing Road to Zero, how can Greens help make zero HIV transmission uh, by 2030 a reality. We're joined by a, an excellent range of panelists this evening. Uh, on my top left, uh, no, my bottom right actually, is Deborah Gold, the CEO of the National AIDS Trust, the UK's HIV rights charity. The National AIDS Trust works to stop HIV from standing in the way of health, dignity and equality and to end uh, new HIV transmissions. On my top left is Ian Green, uh, who's a former CEO of the YMCA England and the current CEO of the Terence Higgins Trust. Now, the Terence Higgins Trust was established in 1982, and it's the UK's leading charity on HIV in the UK and provides support to people living with HIV that amplifies their voices and helps people using their services achieve good sexual health. Uh, the charity was named after Terry Higgins, uh, which was formerly known as the Terry, Terry Higgins Trust, who died the same year at St Thomas's Hospital, and he was 37. And then on my bottom left, we have Baroness Natalie Bennett, a Green Peer in the House of Lords, the former leader of the Green Party of England and World and a former journalist. And then in the middle, we have Liam McClellan, a Green Party member and a HIV activist, who's the former chair of the Young Greens, the youth and the student wing of the Green Party. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you for being with us, uh, especially as we're the, uh, the first event of some of you will be attending this week. And I know that Ian's been busy with uh, media and I know that Deborah's been completely busy with her campaign, the National AIDS Trust, getting out the message of HIV testing week this week. And I know that Liam's been busy as well, tweeting my things, that's great. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's uh, kick off this evening's uh, event. So obviously we've come uh, a long way since the 1980s. Uh, and obviously in the past 40 years, we've seen massive advancements uh, on diagnosis, HIV treatment, <clears throat> excuse me, and prevention. So obviously we're discussing uh, tonight on how we can make uh, zero HIV transmission um, by the end of the decade uh, possible. So I'm gonna go straight into it really and kind of like just ask uh, Natalie really on your basic thoughts on where we've come, where we are and where we're hoping to achieve by the end of the decade. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you everyone for coming along this evening. I think we've, we've had a great sign up um, and thank you LGBTIQA plus Greens for, I think, a great initiative. Um, I have to say and explain that we were planning to sort of very much go to and forth, but I'm actually also at the same time by the joys of Zoom, also in the House of Lords, taking part in the debate on the domestic abuse bill and coming up is a very important amend set of amendments around uh, refuges. Uh, and so I'm going to disappear. I will still be listening in, but I'm going to disappear. So just I apologise for that. It's just the difficulties of the, the under House of Lords being unpredictable. But just to offer some initial thoughts and you know, how important this issue is, even though it's probably disappeared somewhat from the real front page you know, of a public concern, obviously in the age of COVID-19. But I think there's a phrase that I keep talking about when I talk about COVID-19 that's still very much is of huge relevance to this evening. Um, and that's a saying that no one is safe until everybody is safe. And that's something that I think, you know, we, we have increasingly really started to think as a society, as a globe about infectious diseases. And the fact that, you know, no one can say, oh, it's all right, I'm all right, Jack. You know, I, I'm gonna protect myself, it will be fine. What we have to do 
is act and ensure that everybody is safe. And that's why I think this focus this week on testing is hugely important. Um, I mean, looking, I was looking for International AIDS, AIDS Day. I was looking at some of the figures around this. And, you know, 42% of cases are diagnosed late. Even though the rate is falling, there are still so many people out there with HIV who haven't had the chance to be diagnosed. There are still too many cases when the NHS, when the, um, the, tri the uh, sexual health system has the chance to test people and those tests are just not being conducted. And I think it's one of those areas is we're in a real problem with stereotypes. That figure actually rises to 59% among the over 65 age group. And you know, we really have to think about where there is stereotyping about who is likely to um, be infected with HIV and making sure that this is really, we're reaching truly comprehensive services. And if we think about coming back to the COVID example, um, if we look at the countries that have done very, very well in terms of managing COVID, controlling COVID, um, there's a phrase that I think is particularly, I'm not sure if New Zealand originated, but you certainly seem to hear it a lot in Australia and New Zealand, which is go hard and go early. And so the more you take action early on, the more you drive inflection rates right, right down, it actually makes it so much easier to tackle the issue, to deal with the problem. Uh, the longer you leave, the more you operate in a gradual, slow, step-by-step pace. -step That's where the problem keeps going on. As we know, in the case of COVID, it sadly often escalates exponentially. So I think you know, the message from this evening, the message we need to get out in terms of HIV is that um, we really cannot afford complacency. The costs of that, both in human terms and, of course, you know, let's um, I'll try not to be too party political, but let's perhaps put it in Tory terms and say, even if you just look at the money, um, it makes an awful lot of sense um, to really get serious now about really, really driving those infection rates down to get to that zero infection rate by 2030. And, you know, if we can do it or very nearly do it by 2025, that's actually a much better place to be in. So that's perhaps a few introductory thoughts. I will listen in as much as I can, and I'll certainly come back and listen to the recording later. And, you know, I'm at Natalie Ben on, twins, uh, on Twitter, so feel free, anyone who wants to sort of raise anything specifically with me if I can't directly answer it tonight. Um, but thank you, everyone, and I really look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much. Thanks, Natalie. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for obviously all the work you're doing in the, in the House of uh, Lords. So keep going at it and keep pressing. Um, so I think really I, I want to come to uh, Deborah actually on this on to see like where we've actually uh, started out from to where we are now, because there's like a, a 40 year span on what basically been happening. So obviously, if you look back in the 1980s when the AIDS epidemic started, what, how is that like compared to where we are now to then from the National AIDS Trust perspective? Well, that's a, that's a big question, 40 years in a couple of minutes, but uh, HIV is an infection that has lasted more than a generation. And the development in terms of the quality of life of people living with HIV and the science is so enormous um, that I think a lot of people's knowledge and understanding of where we are with HIV now is is actually kind of still a couple of decades behind. So, you know, right from the early days of first identifying HIV and, and really what it was and identifying a, an antibody test to mean that you could work out who had HIV in the first place through to those um, early treatments really that were so difficult, didn't really work and had such horrific side effects for people. Um, things really started to change from the point in the mid 1990s when we discovered, when I say we, I don't mind the National AIDS Trust, I mean we as in the HIV community, you know, really effective antiretroviral treatment. So drugs that work and those drugs have got better and better and better. So that now if you are diagnosed in good time with HIV, uh, which means not late as Natalie talked about, then, very often you may only be taking one tablet a day with very few or no side effects and you're gonna live as long as anyone else. Um, the challenge is that we aren't finding everybody living with HIV and when you're diagnosed late, then that's gonna have much more severe impact on your health. Um, and then I guess the next big discovery is something that we first of all called treatment as prevention and now we call um, U equals U. And that is the knowledge that if you're living with HIV and you're taking HIV medication, very soon the level of virus in your blood will 
go to a level where it's not detectable. And at that point, you can't pass HIV on to anybody else. And then the third really big development is PrEP, which lots of people may have heard of. It's a tablet you can take that prevents you from being able to acquire HIV. And when you take those things together, when you take a group of people living with HIV, the vast majority of whom can't pass HIV on to anyone else, that's something like 87% of all people living with HIV in the UK, including the people that don't know they have it. So you have a smaller and smaller pool of people able to pass HIV on. And then you have a number of people, most especially gay men, but also others, who understand their risk of HIV and are taking PrEP to help protect themselves. Um, and then you have people testing more regularly so that they are finding out they have HIV sooner, um, which is better for their health and means that they also reach a point where they can't pass, pass HIV on more quickly. Those things work together to create the ideal circumstances where we feel like we can confidently say we have everything we need to realistically end new transmissions by 2030, as long as we take the action that we've recommended that I'm sure we'll go on to talk about later on this, this evening. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, thanks for that, Deborah. No, that's, I think that's really a, a good point, really. So we'll obviously come on to um, other points that uh, Deborah pointed out uh, a little bit later on in the panel tonight. Um, but I want to come to to Liam, really, and to kind of see from your perspective, obviously, as a HIV activist, um, how do you think it's how do you think things have changed for, uh, for people who live with HIV, um, Percy themselves, to where we look at, like, for example, like watching It's a Sin recently and comparing to see it on TV screen on how it was back then, but obviously really not knowing the full extent of it. Um, how do you see it from your perspective on the advancements of what we've kind of seen nowadays? Um, I've been really lucky in, I've had um, a couple of friends who um, were diagnosed in, in the 80s, 87 and, and then in, in the 90s. And my friend who was diagnosed in 87 told me how going in to have bloods done, going into to that environment and as green plastic biohazards, uh, PPE was, was everywhere. That's one of the memories that he has from that period to now, um, you know, when I go in and have my bloods done and, and you know, not recently because the nurses are back to, to PPE because of COVID, but it's, it's like a tourniquet and a syringe in and your vials are done and you're gone. Um, like like the, the level in which the understanding and, and the, um, that sort of safety element from, from the people taking your bloods and, and the trust that they have is, is drastically changed. Um, for me, I've just been watching a couple of short videos before coming on to this because I've got my own experience, but then I just wanted to make sure that that resonated with, with other people who, who have openly spoken about living with HIV who, who are of a similar age. And it is, it's the stigma that is often now coming from within our own community. Um, and that I think is, is linked to lack of education. We've, we've had um, SRE education past, you know, it's, it's due to be implemented within schools, yet the implementation of sex and relationship education, SRE education is being kicked further and further down because it's not a priority of this government, of, of any Tory government. It's never gonna be a priority of a Tory government. Um, so for me, like listening to the changes in, in terms of like, it was, it was very much an awareness of a community, you know, whether it was spoken about or not spoken about in the 80s and 90s to now where we have just a, 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 a misinformation or, or not understanding um, the, the drugs that are available, whether it's PrEP, whether it's PEP, what U equals U means. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's either down to ignorance or it's, it's down to the way that the scene has changed as well. You know, we're not in casual conversation with each other anymore in the pub. Like not, not only because of COVID, but the way that Grindr and Scruff and these apps have totally changed the landscape in which gay men, MSM, queer people interact with each other. It's, it's narrowed it down to just the finite, what is it that you actually want from this person? And you know, you're not having these conversations where you exchange knowledge, you exchange information and, and you build relationships. Um, so I think there has been such a gap in um, my generation, younger generations, education around HIV and you know, the, the way in which the community supported people who um, had contracted HIV and, and 
uh, rallied around, um, you know, friends and, and family members. Yeah, no, that's a really good, really good insight, actually, Ian. Thank you for that. Um, so I think, uh, let me come on to Ian, really, because obviously with the Terence Higgins Trust, uh, as well as the, the National Aid Trust as well, you've both been, well, both, both your organisations have been formidable in the amount of work that you've been doing for the past 40 years. So from, uh, from obviously being the CEO, how have you seen the transformation uh, and the kind of the implementation on doing things in a way that will help people understand that, as Liam said, you you equals you, um, importance of obviously this week uh, with HIV testing week. Um, from obviously your perspective uh, as, a, as a charity, uh, the CEO of the charity uh, with the Terence Higgins Trust, how have you seen the change personally uh, as an individual, but also as an organization? Sure, I mean, it's a re really good uh, question, Daniel, I think. I mean, I've been at Terence Singers Trust now for five years as, uh, as chief executive, and even in that short period of time, so much has changed. I mean, that uh, medical advances continues at a pace. I mean, we've had to fight really hard to, for some of those changes. I mean, PrEP didn't come about without a lot of hard work of both Terence Singers Trust and, and the National Age Trust needed to take um, uh, the NHS to court in order to make sure PrEP could become available free on the NHS. And it's taken a long period of time to make sure that's um, actually come to, to fruition, even after that court case. Um, I mean, I think from the early days of the, uh, the pandemic, uh, a lot of it was about raw activism. And if anyone's seen It's a Sin, you'll have seen uh, people in the corner um, uh, planning what they're going to do about education campaigns. Um, I, I know that was, was colleagues from the, the then Terence Higgins Trust, and many of them were then chucked out of the pubs because of the um, uh, gay community actually didn't want to hear that message at that point in time. I mean, I remember I was 18 in uh, 1983 and just exploring my, my sexuality um, and suddenly then be beginning to hear about this strange virus that was impacting mainly people in New York and in the States, but then a real fear about that to uh, come into the UK. Um, and at a time in my life when uh, I was wanting things, expecting things uh, to be vibrant and I was um, excited about what life had in store for me, there was this sense of fear and foreboding. And I guess for me, it's been there uh, ever since. And I think in the life cycle of any organisation, you'll see that how organisations evolve uh, to resonate with the challenges uh, of a particular point uh, in time. Uh, and I think Terence Higgins Trust and other uh, HIV organisations uh, like the National Age Trust have always done that. We've always been innovative. We've always evolved to meet the needs of people at a particular point in time. Either people living with HIV, uh, making sure that actually that it's not just about providing people with the support they need, but actually as somebody who's lived with HIV for almost 25 years now, I just don't want to live, I want to thrive. And I want to make sure that there's an environment created that encourages me and enables me to, to thrive. I think uh, as well in our prevention activities though, uh, there's been a huge amount of innovation. I mean, who would have thought, I mean, the first time I took a HIV test was uh, back in 1984 when tests were just becoming available. It was in a dingy basement of Leeds General Infirmary um, and I gave a false name and it was awful. The, the whole ambience was terrible. You can now sit at home, take a test at home um, and get the results in five, 10 minutes. Uh, so things have massively changed. And it's really important that as campaigning organisations, as service delivery organisations, and as prevention organisations, we keep abreast of the time. And that's why engaging with uh, political parties of all flavours is such an important part of that. No, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more, actually, with that. So obviously, I think um, we'll kind of move on, really. So I think looking at from a, a wider perspective, so currently at the moment, um, figures suggest that there are just over 105,000 people in the UK that are living with HIV today. And that was from up until 2019. And there's between, from uh, HIV commissioned um, uh, data and also from the government state, there's about between just under five, uh, 6,000 to 7,500 people uh, that are actually undiagnosed. So that's a, quite a large number of people uh, that they don't know of their status. 
So I think kind of moving on to the next question is, why is HIV testing just so important? Is it because people know what their status will be and they can have treatment, et cetera? Or is it about trying to capture that data as quickly as possible so we can move forward in a way to know who's HIV positive, but then we can then provide them with the treatment necessary so we can press the virus. So I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to, uh, to Deborah on this question. HIV testing is the, is the perfect, like virtuous circle of all of those things. Um, you know, you can't you can't say one is more important than the other from a, from an individual point of view and from a kind of ethical moral point of view. The absolute imperative in terms of HIV testing is for the individual to be able to access treatment that means that they will live well and be healthy. Um, and obvious, and the longer somebody goes without being diagnosed once they've acquired HIV, the more ill they will be. And if if the gap between um, infection and diagnosis is very long, they can obviously become very sick. Um, so firstly, it's to support the health of the individual, but the wonderful byproduct of that is that the quicker that somebody is diagnosed with HIV, the shorter the period of time when, without knowing they have HIV, they may be at risk of passing it on to other people because once they're on treatment, they'll get to the point where they aren't able to pass it on. So it's the reason HIV testing is so important is because it does both of those things. Um, it's the absolute key to both making sure that individuals live the best possible life and thrive, as Ian said, and making sure that we really are finally, after 40 years, able to um, get to a point where we can see the end. Can I just add, Daniel, to that? I think, um, yeah. and that's why I think it's so important that HIV testing is normalised. It's not something that just happens uh, in a sexual health clinic. Uh, um, it's something that we absolutely need to make sure it is accessible to people where they would like to get tested. And one of the key recommendations from the HIV Commission uh, was that rather than have opt-in testing, uh, there should be a process of opt-out testing. So whenever um, blood is drawn in any formal healthcare setting, we should be offering somebody a HIV test. Um, you know, there are still too many people who go to a sexual health clinic and who aren't offered a HIV test and leave without a HIV test. But when you register to go to a new GP, you should be offered a HIV test. When you go for a, a cervical smear, you should be offered a HIV test. In all those opportunities, we need to make sure that um, we grasp them because as the numbers get smaller, it's going to be harder to find those remaining six, 7,000 people. So that's why normalising testing is absolutely crucial in order to end uh, new HIV transmissions by 2030. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And just kind of on that point, one of the difficulties is um, we've been so successful in the UK at helping those people that kind of fall within um, higher risk populations to encourage them to come for testing regularly. And that is fantastic because we really needed to do that. But if you look underneath those figures, um, Daniel, that you were talking about earlier, you know, the PHE figures, they show that a really high proportion of the people who are being diagnosed with HIV um, haven't been testing regularly. So now that we're getting down to these smaller numbers of people undiagnosed, this, you know, five to eight, 10,000 people who have HIV and don't know it, they are likely to be people that don't realize they're at risk, who aren't getting these prevention messages and who are much less likely to take themselves to a sexual health clinic or go to a chemist and buy a self test or you know order one of THT's tests for testing week because you have to know you're at risk to actively take the action to do that and that's why what Ian is talking about this kind of wide-scale screening so that when you're just happen to be in a position where your blood is being taken it's being tested for HIV that is the absolute key to starting to identify these final people and make sure they get the treatment they need and that we make progress. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree, agree more with that one. Um, so, so Liam, I think, um, do you kind of like have a, a personal experience on like where you've seen like HIV testing has kind of advanced obviously since, um, as we've seen like it, it's a sin where things were quite slow to begin with and now in the last like decade, things have dramatically changed in a way that we've not seen before, where as like the Terence Higgins Trust can obviously provide 
um, home test kits now. So from your perspective, how do you think HIV testing week is, is important to kind of nailing down uh, transmissions in a way that we can actually see the end of the tunnel? Um, both, both Deborah and Ian have, have picked upon it really well. It's, it's about the normalisation of um, testing, of regular testing, destigmatisation of, of sexual health screening. Um, just thinking about going to the GU here in Nottingham, and it is it, at City Hospital. It's in a tatty separate building. Um, they, they put um, they put women's health like like pregnancy, and they've split it. And it, it's just it's 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 a building that you know someone going into that building what they're going in for. So it's, it's not really, there's no discretion around it. And, and whilst there is the stigma around sexual health testing, you know, that, that is needed. Um, I probably sit on the fence more towards um, home test kits, whilst I appreciate there are a very good way for people to access. Um, if you are going to test positive and you're testing positive at home and you're doing a self-test kit without anyone around you or without any access to a service, um, you know, I think that is worrying. I'm aware that, that a lot of information is sent out with these home test kits. Um, when THT has offices here in Nottingham before they closed down, um, a couple of the staff that worked here would, would offer to come and visit and do a home test kit with the person. And as a key worker, they would sit there, they would talk it through. You know, if it came back negative, they would provide advice for, for safer sex practices. Um, you know, and, and discuss prep and stuff like that. Um, but it is, it's, it's when, when the, so I can only talk about Nottingham because that's my experience, you know, when there was only two members of, three members of staff working for a HIV outreach charity within the city of Nottingham, trying to cover an area that vast, you know, it's, it's really difficult. And then obviously when, when the city council and the CCG cut that funding, Terence Higgins Trust, pulled out of Nottingham. So there's now no HIV services outside of the GU. And um, so it's very difficult going like going region by region to understand what is there. You know, if I just go down the road to Leicester, they've got trade and they've got lass. And you know, trade is doing some fantastic stuff about getting out in the communities because we are five white people sat on this call discussing HIV and HIV is a lot broader than just five white people sat on a call and trade has really yeah, acknowledged yeah. that and is, is working with communities outside of, of what you know they're, they're working with South Asian communities they're working with black communities and when when Ian and Deborah were discussing about those people that are the hardest to find within those who aren't testing it is the communities that that aren't being represented on this call which, which is where we need to be getting out and it's where we need to be investing. Councils and CCGs need to be investing that money into that outreach rather than saying they're going to bring it in-house and as they're doing in Nottingham, sending people to Citizens Advice Bureau to get the information and the support that they used to be able to get from Terence Against Trust. Yeah, no, it's, that's a, I think that's a really important thing really to say that there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done so we can reach that zero HIV transmissions by 2030. It is a, a really short time, really. It's only literally less than nine years away. So there's amount of work that not only just um, National AIDS Trust, but also Terence Higgins Trust kind of forcing the government to kind of realize that we need to do this. If we are to see this outcome, we all want to see, especially with, which I'll come on to in a second, with Matt Hancock only stating in the House of Commons on the 30th of January, 2019, that we're going to see an end to HIV transmissions by 2030. There's a lot of work that needs to be done by the government. So, and that's why I think both of the organizations, uh, the Tenancy Against Trust and the National AIDS Trust are a force of nature, basically. They really, really are. And, and I know that the work that they'll, they've done, what they're going to do and what they're going to achieve by 2030 can be realistic, but it's down to those higher above to kind of pull their fingers, <laughs> really, in a nice, polite term. Um, so I think I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to, but I will kind of share a little bit of a personal story myself because I was diagnosed in 2018. And before that, uh, I would actually, it was on my 29th, just after my 29th birthday, and I started to feel ill. Uh, and I felt ill for quite some time, been to the GP, uh, and they diagnosed me with having a virus they gave me antibiotics um though unfortunately antibiotics didn't like me uh which i'll come on to in a little bit why 
uh, and then it kept on going for about three months. And then the GP specifically, as Ian was talking about earlier with GPs uh, surgeries uh, on HIV testing, uh, the GP said, have you had a HIV test uh, yet? I went, no, I haven't. Uh, thinking nothing of it, it'll be fine. Had the, uh, the, the HIV test, uh, came back a week later, and that's how quick the advancements are on HIV testing nowadays with GP surgeries, they're quite quick. This was on a Thursday, so weekend. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so, and by the following week, uh, I went to the GP surgery and uh, they diagnosed me with having HIV and which was a complete shock. Uh, I had this kind of very naive thinking that, oh no, it will be fine, nothing's wrong with me, just the really bad virus. No, it wasn't the case at all. And then obviously since then, within a month, I'd obviously started medication, started treatment, and the virus had suppressed within that short time frame. So the, the normality that we need to kind of see, whether it's home testing, uh, a, a huge advancement on national testing in a way that's not been done before, which I'll come on to a little bit later, kind of needs to kind of move forward, really. So I just kind of wanted to, to share that with everyone, really. So I'm not just here for the head of it. <laughs> I am actually here because <laughs> I know what it's like. Plus, I've also got this. So <laughs> thanks, Ian. Uh, <laughs> it's a lovely fit. Anyway, let's let's move on. Um, just, I'm really sorry to oh, talk about you. I just want to do, just before you move on, I want to do a little plea for home testing because I thought that Liam raised some concerns that people have. And I know that home testing is something that THT, sorry, Terence Higgins Trust, uh, make available during testing week. And so I, th I, I just wanted to kind of, is that all right, quickly come back? Yeah, yeah absolutely. To the worries that you talked about mm. in, your, in your answer because I know that it feels like it's something a still a bit new even though it's been around for a few years and that people do have that concern and I guess I just want to say what is most important is that people who have HIV have the opportunity to know their status it is always better for somebody to know they have HIV and then have the all the power and the control to make the choice about what they want to do about it and what uh, home testing does is give people the option and for lots of people going into for example a sexual health clinic as you've just described Liam can be you know incredibly intimidating and also just for some people it just is more comfortable to be able to do it at home I think it's it's existed for long enough now that we've kind of seen how well it works and what's great about it is that people that take tests at home are often different people to the people that might test in other ways. So it's encouraging people that wouldn't otherwise know their status. So the option of kind of removing it means that those people wouldn't find out they have HIV. So I just wanna, I think that your kind of worries are valid, but just say that they work really, really well. And also, yeah, it's really rubbish the way there's uh, so little funding for HIV support services, I hear you. We're fighting to try and get people to increase it. Yeah, no, I think that's done. Yeah, no, that's I think that's actually a really valid point, actually, and it's poignant really that no matter if people want to get tested at a sexual health clinic, but uh, they can do, but if they don't feel comfortable, then there are other options available. It's yeah. not just the one source. There are always other options available to people, whether it's a hospital uh, because if you have a GE unit there, or you can do it at home. So the the variety nowadays is a lot than what compared it was back in the in the 1980s so everything has changed dramatically um so but thank you for that deborah i appreciate that um so let's kind of move on really to the kind of the nitty gritty bit now so as i said um earlier over two years ago uh, actually just saturday on the 30th of june 2019 can't believe it's been this long already the secretary of health the secretary of health and social care matt hancock announced in the house of commons that the government set forth with the aim of ending hiv transmission by 2030, by 2030, Tifa. Subsequently, later that year, the HIV Commission was launched with the aim of reaching zero HIV, uh, HIV transmission by 2030. So I think I kind of want to open this up really from, from everyone's perspective. Um, uh, so what has uh, happened since the HIV Commission was established in the latter part of 2019? What is the HIV Commission? Uh, and the second part to this question is, have they made any recommendations on how uh, this will be, uh, so reaching uh, zero HIV transmission by 2030, achievable? 
Um, so I'm going to come to uh, I'm going to come to Ian. If I if I kick off, then then Deborah can come in because this is where we do a bit of a, a double act. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're you, we're used to doing this together, so it'll be. So, so, so we, we it's it's great that there's the commitment from government uh, to get to, to zero HIV transmissions by 2030. That's really important. It took a while for that to come and required a lot of of, of activity from both of our organisations to enable that to happen. And he reconfirmed that um, at, well, on World AIDS Day. Uh, last year when the commission reported. I, I think that don't give the government credit for the HIV commission. It was uh, uh, um, our charities that established the independent HIV commission and, we'll, and we were later joined by the Elton John AIDS Foundation and we funded that solely from our charitable money. We didn't get any government funding for that. Actually it's really important that it was seen to be completely independent uh, of government and, and, and we took the view that, that we believe that we have all of the tools in the toolbox to end new HIV transmissions in the UK. What we needed was perhaps a fresh pair of eyes to ex examine that uh, and uh, a commission was felt to be the right approach. And so we asked uh, Inga Beale, who was the former chief executive of Lloyds of London, a very successful uh, business leader uh, to chair the, the commission. Uh, and there was about to, to 12 other commissioners, uh, parliamentarians, academics, um, there were people from um, the civil society, there were people living with HIV, um, a really diverse group of people um, who gave up their time to really work with, with us and with an expert advisory group with clinicians and with people from Public Health England and from uh, the Department of Health and from NHS England to examine what we needed to do to make this happen. Uh, and over a sort of a 12 month process, uh, the uh, commission came up with 20 key recommendations that, were that, that was launched on, on World AIDS Day uh, of this year, slight delay because of the challenges of, of COVID, but only about a, a four month delay. Um, and I've got to say that again, we had really strong cross party support uh, for the Commission's recommendations. Uh, and you know, for us as non-party political organisations, it's really important that we get buy-in from key parliamentarians and decision makers from across the political spectrum, because that's when we'll get um, change happening. Uh, but we also we've got a responsibility as well to hold government's feet to the fire as well. So that's also really key and really important. So that's uh, the process. I think perhaps uh, Deborah can say a bit about some of the key recommendations that the, the Commission came up with. That was brilliant timing because my uh, internet just went down and I dropped out of the call. Am I? <laughs> and then I, I just yeah. managed to come back in in the moment that you said, and perhaps Deborah can do this. <laughs> so, hurrah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so wh what was really fantastic about the commission is that both we managed to get that kind of fresh pair of eyes, as Ian said, but we also were really proud of the process we went through that meant that we reached a consensus from a really wide range of people inside the HIV sector, the statutory organisations, clinicians, academics, people from voluntary sector organisations, people living with HIV, um, to really look at an enormous amount of evidence and boil it down to, in the end, 20 key recommendations. And I'm not going to tell you about 20 recommendations now. I would encourage you to go to the website, which is hivcommission.org.uk, and you can read the report, the short or the long version, and see it. But just uh, headlines for you. Um, the first thing is that we set really challenging targets for the government because we know if we're going to reach this um, target, I think a couple of people have said, it's going to get harder the closer we get. And so we need to make the majority of progress quickly so that we can really focus in the last five years. So we have um, targets for 2025 and they are broken down by different groups because we know that, um, I don't know how many of people watching know about the... Um, 90, 90, 90 targets, but they are targets set by UNAIDS, which are that 90% of people in the country um, know their HIV status. And of those, 90% of those are accessing treatment. And of those, 90% of those have an undetectable viral load. Um, and overall, we're meeting those 90, 90, 90 targets. We're one of a small number of countries around the world who are, re who are already meeting them. But if you look at it by individual areas and if you look at it by individual populations, we're not always meeting it. So we know that our targets are challenging and we'd like to get make 80 percent of progress by 2025. That's the first thing. Uh, and then the two headline recommendations 
are one around normalizing HIV testing and we've talked about that a lot this evening and it's around making opt out rather than opt in testing standard every time you draw blood anywhere in the health service. And the second one is really about leadership and accountability. Um, and it's really saying that one of the challenges in HIV is so much confusion about who's responsible. Is it the Department of Health? Is it NHS England? Is it Public Health England? Is it local authorities? And so for us, the buck stops with the government. And so it's making it really, really clear that responsibility for meeting these targets sits with the Department of Health, but also the Cabinet Office to make it a cross governmental responsibility uh, with an annual report to Parliament, which means that we hope it stays on the political agenda and progress has to be made year on year. And then finally, that the government commits to being trying to become first country in the world, bit of pushing ourselves to do this, to meet this um, and develops an action plan to show how they're gonna do that. And we've had some great engagement, as Ian said, really good cross party support some good commitments at the launch. And now it's all about trying to hold the government to account and make sure that action plan is published, that it's as challenging as it can be, that we get the funding in place that we need to make all of this possible. And then there's lots of recommendations for the government, but also when you read the report for local areas and things that, you know, kind of local party members, for example, can be pushing their, um, you know, Greens have got lots of local councillors. So there's good actions that you can take locally to try and support this as well. Oh, you're on mute, Daniel. Mute, Daniel. I am. <laughs> I'm glad you told me. <laughs> um, so that's actually a really good, interesting point, uh, Deborah, because obviously I think uh, looking at it from a, a local perspective is something I definitely wanted to come on to a little bit later on before we finish. Um, so let me come to, to Ian, uh, Liam, really. So from obviously setting up, uh, from the HIV being set up uh, in 2019, um, do you think from your perspective that the 2030 uh, aim is, is achievable? Uh, and obviously have, have you kind of read the recommendations and kind of what's your uh, perspective from it, from obviously someone uh, who obviously lives with HIV? I think it is achievable. Like um, we, we were hitting, the UK was hitting the 1990 90 early. Um, it's, it's maintaining the funding and increasing the funding that is dedicated to this um, year on year to ensure that with inflation, you know, we're not having things chipped away here and there. Um, and like a term that I picked up very early on working within and volunteering within charities like ring fence funding and HIV funding needs to be ring fenced. It, it needs to not be something that a council and a CCG can just cut. Um, and often those cuts are happening because specifically here in Nottingham, something has happened in Westminster, which means the council here in Nottingham is now having to make drastic cuts. And the first things that happen are children and adult services, GU services. Uh, and drug and alcohol support and often those people aren't the ones with the voice and um, how it can happen like and i'm going to speak green party speak for, for ian deborah here like we have we have over 370 councillors elected across um england and wales and the green party's strength is in its local and regional organizing yeah we have some fantastic people in westminster but that's just a voice and it's a drop in the ocean compared to where our power lies and our power lies in the activism of our members in the local areas. That's why we got 370 plus councillors elected at, at the last local elections. And that's where we can impact that change because that's where we're able to put pressure on local authorities and local government to ensure that short term policies and targets that are highlighted here in, in the HIV Commission is met you know not cutting funding to a specialized charity when the only other option is citizens cis, uh, citizens advice and um, you know to ensure that there's a holistic approach being done to to match these targets you know again we've we've, we've mentioned um about about the sort of the caucasianness of, of this panel and and when when the um local council is not reflecting it's the people that it's serving and it's not gonna meet these targets. Um, and again, like just looking at the education side, like the stigma that is still around and the lack of education that is there, that, that doesn't need to be, you know, that's something that local councils can fight to change. Um, and like just tying it back in, I think the first thing 
for me that I noticed um, in, in It's a Sin is, is when um, Ollie Alexander's character throws the box of condoms off the ferry. And like just straight away, you kind of just go, hmm, <laughs> like this is a foretelling of, of what is to come. Um, you know, so it, it, it's just keeping the conversation going and, and just making the information that is out there accessible. Um, and you know, this, this HIV commission report is accessible. Like the action points are broke down into small bullet points. If you want to then read further, you know, it's spread out further um, underneath each of those bullet points. Um, and you know, if, if reading is something that isn't, isn't accessible for you, there's so many little videos that are out there. Um, both Terence Higgins Trust, National AIDS Trust, um, you know, TEDx have done some as well. That, that are you know three to five minutes and, and are really accessible. Daniel, can I just just reinforce what what Liam's been saying in relation to to local leadership, which is absolutely crucial. And there's a, one of the recommendations from the commission's report really focuses on the development of local. Um, uh, HIV uh, action plans to get to, to zero transmissions. So I just want to just to commend Brighton and Hove Council, um, obviously which is green led, uh, for the work that they uh, have been doing and are doing. Uh, they absolutely absolutely prioritise um, HIV prevention and support funding from for specialist agencies. And there's a number of specialist agencies that are, are funded uh, by the council. But, but also we, we took the HIV Commission to Brighton and Hove uh, as part of the, the process of engagement and just to see the sort of the strength of the voluntary sector and how that was really working collaboratively with the council um, to drive down uh, new HIV transmissions and to really understand the local epidemic. Uh, and that's where you're going to get on a local level um, some real opportunity to, to, to uh, contribute uh, to the target and the uh, Deborah and I um, briefed the, the leadership of the council um, just after Christmas, I think it was, just in terms of, 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 the, uh, of, of where we got to. And I know they, there's going to be some announcements, I think, coming out from the local authority in the next couple of days about what they want to do uh, to take this forward, which is fantastic. So, so I'm bigging up um, uh, Brighton and Hove Council here. No, I, no, I really appreciate that, Ian. Um, obviously, I'll, I'm just going to do that later on, but that's nice of you. <laughs> I can steal your thunder, Daniel. Fine, don't worry. I, I won't. I won't. I won't be upset. <laughs> um, no, I think actually it's, that's a really good point. Really, so I think that kind of like leads us in a, in a really good segment to, to our next part. So, from uh, from a Green Party's perspective, and I think this is where it'll be quite um, valuable um, to, to hear your uh, thoughts on this, uh, Deborah and Ian. How can we as, as a Green Party, as activists, as campaigners, whether that's on HIV, whether that's just on a general, uh, uh, as a general party, but how can we get involved and how can we kind of push that agenda forward with local councils? Uh, how can we then do that from uh, elected officials, uh, from Green Party councillors up and down uh, England and Wales? You must remember we're separate from Scotland and Northern Ireland, um, <laughs> so people don't get confused. Um, how, how can we kind of like do that from our um, position? Is that policy basis, um, activism? How can we do that in a way that we can kind of enforce the change at, at a local level? Um, so let me come to, I'll come to Deborah. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I'm just going to say it's HIV testing week. So everybody watching should be taking an HIV test. That's the first thing. Um, and then um, in, I think there's loads, actually, that local activists can do that would be really, really useful. And if you take a look at the go on the HIV Commission website and take a look at the recommendations, there are a couple of key ones for local areas. And the one that springs to my mind is that we're asking every local authority to draw up its own action plan. Um, I actually can't tell whether I'm still on the call because everybody's gone completely yes, you are. You are. silent. Okay, great. You're not moving, but you can hear me. I'll carry on. Um, we're asking every local area to draw up its own HIV action plan that talks about how it is going to make sure that it reaches the 2030 goals. And I think that is a really useful lever to use locally to try to make local areas reinvigorate their own actions and in terms of activists you can be speaking to your local representatives where you've got green party councillors asking them to be pushing in the local authority and asking questions about that action plan asking questions about funding of prevention and support activities for people living with hiv as liam has raised 
Um, so that I would definitely be thinking about kind of getting in touch with your kind of local councillors. And if you don't have Green Party local councillors, it doesn't mean that you can't be writing to whoever represents you locally. You can take a different approach if you're talking to somebody who is a kind of ally in your party, as opposed to talking to somebody who is your representative. But in both cases, if you can be raising the commission locally, that would be incredibly useful. Um, and you can also sign up on the website of the commission if you want to be kept in touch with what's happening. I'm going to stop because you're going to ask Ian a similar question and I don't want to use up all the ideas. <laughs> oh, no, don't. That could have been fun. We could just <laughs> no, but we too, we, you know. We, we, we. As, as I stole Daniel's thunder for a bit later exactly. on. Exactly. I'm not so rude, Ian. <laughs> I know, I'm terrible. The, the only thing I just want to, to add is that if you look, up, look over the 40 years of, of HIV, um, yeah. it's all been about Absolutely. activism. All of it's been about activism. Um, and, and I think that the Green Party is really well known um, and also is very strong in terms of local activism in, in local communities. Uh, and so that's why I think Deborah's point there is so, so important. It's about what, what you can do locally to just try and make sure that you know, the, the decisions that Liam highlighted, which have been happening in Nottingham, that they're challenged locally, they're challenged in the local press, um, that you talk to our, our organisations, we'll be there uh, with the limited resources that we've got to support you um, in thinking about what some of those sort of key challenges uh, might be and where the opportunities might lie. Um, so I think that for us, it's about making sure that that cross-party coalition of activism is brought together so we can actually continue to hold whatever party is in power at Westminster they're all going to need their feet holding to the fire and that's not going to come unless we all campaign and we are um, uh, focused uh, on the prize and the prize must be that opportunity of ending new HIV transmissions it's absolutely achievable um, and I think that we need your help uh, in order to get there. Daniel you're muted again. Oh, I am. Uh, I think we might have just lost Deborah uh, shortly. Um, <clears throat> but what I would like to do um, is actually come to, to Natalie as she's just rejoined us. So uh, thanks for uh, coming back to us, Natalie. So I think the question that I, I, I did ask uh, before was how can the Greens as a Green Party, how can we kind of influence, uh, no matter if it's from obviously um, House of Commons or House of Laws perspective or activism on the ground how can they work together within the green party and on the ground at, with local parties and elected representatives well great and thank you very much i have been able to listen in and i've been really been enjoying the discussion and i thought particularly actually the discussion on home testing i learned a lot from that so thank you very much uh, to deborah on that um, and I think it was Liam who described both the Terence Higgins Trust and the National AIDS Trust as, as forces of nature. Um, and I think it's been really impressive to see the level of kind of political understanding of political awareness. And I'm going to quote Deborah again saying, you know, the buck stops with the government. Um, and I think that's a really important point to make. We have local authorities um, who are so struggling. I, I just indeed in the domestic abuse bill been reflecting on the fact of, you know, how desperately underfunded, how they're struggling to provide even the statutory services. And so we can't allow the national government to avoid um, responsibility. And I think Liam was talking about the importance of local action, but you, we've also got to work at this national level. And I think what Ian said in terms of the Greens being the real heart of activism, you know, one of the other ways I'd put that is um, people may be aware of the term the Overton window, which is the framework of what can be considered as normal possible politics, what's in the range of what you can actually say. And one of our roles in life as Greens is to shift that window, to be more ambitious, to be more progressive, to say this is beyond the possible. You know, again, to be a little party political, if you put, you know, Tories and Labour in a room, you might find the overtime window was quite narrow. If you get the greens in there, you make sure there's at least one green in the room, uh, then the window tends to get uh, broader, the possibilities are greater. And even if you only manage to shift the centre, the centre has moved to a better place. But I think also, and I was very pleased, Ian, you know, to hear what you were saying about Brighton and Hove Council running at, run by the greens as a minority administration. You, what we can also do is demonstrate what's possible when you really set a high level of ambition and that's what we can do as Greens, whether it's in Brighton and Hove or indeed around the country, there's 18 councils in which we're part of some um, 
some form of um, uh, cross-party coalition. They're often called rainbow coalitions. So we have green cabinet members in, I think, last count I saw was 18. So again, we can really shift and raise the level of ambition. And I think that's what we can do as Greens. Um, you know, we say that another world is possible. We really can do things differently. We have to transform the way things are. And that means being really ambitious about the health of the nation. You know, we talk about public health in the broadest and biggest sense. And I, I once years ago actually went to a, um, an international meet, a meeting of public health doctors in Manchester and I must admit, when I, I sort of before I stood up, I sort of looked at my speech and thought, "Am I actually kind of, you know, telling my grandmother how to suck eggs? Um, that, um, you know, I'm just saying what public health is, and they understand, you know, that cycle paths and clean air and things are about public health." What I found was people were so pleased that they thought there's a political party that really gets it. And you know, if we ask what society is about, society is about giving people a healthy life where they're treated with respect where everyone knows they've got the access to the resources they need for a decent life. So I would say that's what the, the Greens' role in the political spectrum is. And, you know, I'll have to add, you know, and increasingly to be running things and delivering on it directly and individually. But in the meantime, we don't have to be there to make a difference. Thanks very much, Daniel. Thanks, Natalie. Exactly. Uh, so I think I, I kind of want to come on to, to Liam on this, because I know that you've obviously been a HIV activist, you still are. Um, so from your perspective, from on the boots on the ground, should I say, um, how can us as Greens, as campaigners, et cetera, kind of enforce, and I know that Deborah was relating to this earlier, how can we kind of like kind of enforce uh, the change that's kind of needed to see the, the end of the tunnel by 2030? Um, so a first thing would be to reach out to your local party um, and, and actually like sit down and have a look at uh, this HIV Commission Action Plan. Have a look to see who is your local councillor for health and social care, adult, adult social care as well. And because that's the person you want to reach out and speak to. Um, often they change around quite a lot. Um, it, was, it was one person here who, who was responsible for, for with the withdrawal, well, they weren't responsible for the withdrawal of funding, but their name was on the withdrawal of funding and it's, it's cycled through to someone else. So always keep, do keep on top of that. Um, activism wise, um, it, it depends what level of energy you have to commit to, to any form of activism and um, be, please be wary of, of activism burnout. Um, but like, you know, recently, last year, start of last year, I had a piece published within the Eco Sprinter, which is the Green European Journal for, for the Federation of Young European Greens around HIV um, PrEP. Uh, PrEP being a feminist fight, the campaign for PrEP being a feminist fight. And then a month later, Matt Hancock was just like, we're going to make it available on the NHS. <laughs> so you can sometimes find yourself putting a lot of energy in one avenue and it, it, it resolves itself. And then you sort of take a step back and go, right, what, what is the next area? And, and for me, it's, it's looking, it's, it's always European level. Like we can focus a lot on what's happening in the UK, um, but I like to see where we've got a reach across Europe. And whilst we may have come out of the EU in terms of the reach that we have, a lot of the work that we can do and we can learn, specifically learn from is how things are being done in, in different regions. Um, and you know, I've, I've done a little bit of, of stuff on policy here in the Green Party and having a look at what our policy is and updating that and putting in the short-term policy aims that enable councils to actually go, well, actually we don't need a government to direct us to do that. This is something that we can do ourselves. Um, and, and you know, having a read through this HIV commission report, you'd be able to pull together some short-term policies that a local council could put forward. Um, I started by putting on a LGBT IQA youth group at the college I was at um, back in 2004. Um, so section 28 had just been repelled, which meant that colleges could no longer say, no, you can't have a queer youth group. Um, and we got um, a group of NHS nurses in to do as what we called a, a sex re-education re because my sex education was um, heterosexual. <laughs> there, was, there was nothing that, that covered LGBTIQA plus sex ed. So, so we did something around that. And that's when I got involved with Staffordshire Buddies, um, which is where my HIV activism really started from. And, and like stuff has shifted, like the buddy system has massively changed and there is less of a need for that sort of one-to-one -one, um, mentoring um, because there's, there is a little bit less stigma 
but as um, we have an aging population who are living with HIV, we're often finding that these people are then going back into the closet if they're going into care homes or if they're having home care. So it's then important to see, okay, how can we educate because um, health and social care has been so privatized, how can we educate people who are, who are on a minimum wage job, who, who are probably working zero hours contracts to, to take some time away to, to sort of connect with um, the people that, that they're giving healthcare services to, who are perhaps a little bit afraid to reach out and talk to them about their, their status um, as, as they've sort of gone back into the closet with, with going into care. Thanks, Ian. That's yeah, that's really really interesting, actually. Um, and I, I like how you kind of like put in the policy part there. That was really nice. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Which is actually what I'm going to actually kind kind of come on to really just quickly um, from everyone. Um, so I think if a, a party doesn't have, uh, no matter if it's the Green Party, obviously this is aimed specifically at the Green Party uh, or any other party, if they don't have the policies, obviously from the recommendations from HIV Commission, should we do that to be reflective? Of society uh, and if so what should we kind of look towards from the HIV Commission and obviously from both of your charities as well um, from the Terence Higgins Trust and the National AIDS Trust so I kind of want to pick start off with um, I'll go with Deborah and then obviously I'll come on to the the party side for, with uh, Natalie and Liam shortly. You're on mute Deborah. I'm on mute and also my uh, internet keeps going down and I keep dropping off the call and then reappearing and I actually missed the question. <laughs> and though I am ca capable of just talking as people that know me, can you, can you repeat the question for me? Absolutely, I can do. So, I, I, so as um, a political party, as the Green Party or any other party, um, if we don't have policies that obviously are reflective of the HIV Commission, should we have those that are reflective of society as well. So we can obviously um, have that goal together uh, as this isn't just uh, the National AIDS Trust or Terence Higgins Trust, this is a society aim and a global aim as well uh, to, to, to remember that. Uh, should we have policies that are reflective as the HIV Commission recommendation states? Sure, uh, yeah, you should. <laughs> um, that, that's, that's, that's the quick version of the answer, you know, it's, We've really a lot of what we've been talking about this evening is how to make sure that HIV absolutely remains on the agenda and that the energy is behind it to get us to the goal that we're all working towards. And that takes commitment. And, you know, Ian talked about how important it is for this to be a non-partisan issue. And it's so crucial because the more that all of the different political parties prioritise this as an issue, the easier it is to then get action to happen on it. Um, and so, and I, th I think this is what you were kind of referring to, but although the HIV Commission lays out some actions that we can take in England to move us towards this 2030 goal, the 2030 goal is actually a challenge from UN AIDS, which is the UN HIV organisation. It's a global goal. Um, the 1990 goals are also global goals. So um, I think it would be, if you, if you haven't already, it would be incredibly important for the Green Party to kind of sign up to reaching that goal and then taking its own, um, deciding its own kind of actions nationally and locally in terms of what you can do as a party to kind of contribute towards moving towards that goal. And, you know, NAT, we're, a, we're an HIV and human rights organization, but all of our activities are done through policy and campaigning work. That's, that's what we do. So uh, if you're gonna ask me if policy work is important, my answer is always gonna be yes. <laughs> Thanks, Deborah. <laughs> Ian, so obviously from a Terence Higgins point of view, uh, you're obviously the leading charity on HIV support and services, etc. So obviously those services are, are crucial. So obviously they'll need to be reflected in every kind of policy. Um, so obviously, because as a Green Party, we, we like to have a, a name of um, seeing a, a neutrality of, of emissions of, of emissions by 2030. So we, we quite like the 2030 aim. Uh, <laughs> so we're quite in harmony there together. Um, so from your perspective, what should we really be looking at specifically? Is it an AIDS um, specific policy or is it a HIV specific policy? Uh, so I, I think there are two, two things I, I, I would say. One is we, we spent a lot of time at the beginning of our, our conversation focusing on, 
on testing and I think a, an approach around and, and a, a policy uh, priority uh, of resourcing uh, opt out to HIV testing. I think that is something that we would encourage uh, the Green Party to seriously uh, consider. And I know there are, um, and again, there'll be an announcement, I think, coming out from Brighton and Hove, imminently, I understand, uh, which I think is really, really positive. I think the other thing, and we've not spent as much time uh, on this, or we, we, we've skirted around the edges, you know, so much has changed with uh, HIV in relation to medical advances. One area that's not changed enough is around stigma. Uh, and I think that to make sure that as a party you plant a flag firmly in the ground to say stigma and discrimination for people impacted by HIV is completely unacceptable and we are going to be working so hard to make sure that stigma uh, is eradicated. I mean you don't only have to see um, in the uh, in It's a Sin just the extent of that stigma in the 1980s Thank goodness it's nowhere nearly as bad as it was then, but it's still quite significant for many people. Uh, and that's, I think, another thing that in terms of a policy priority for the Green Plant Party to, to really consider. Yeah, no, it's a really good point, actually. And obviously, yeah, we should have come on to, to stigma, which I think was the aim that we would like to have done. So that's my fault. <laughs> but there is there has been so much stigma out there. Um, and I've received personal stigma too. I've received uh, a death threat as well that I should die because I've got HIV so that we've got a long way to go um, and we've got a lot more educational um, to do to, to the general public as well for them to be informed for them to still understand that it's completely different from the 80s to now um, so yeah um, so let me come on to, to, to Natalie um, so from a uh, obviously as a, um, a peer in the house of lords how can uh, uh, from your perspective uh, as well as a former uh, party leader of the Green Party, how can we kind of see that policy change? Well, I think, first of all, I've just been looking actually at our, our policy on sexual health. Um, so policy.greenparty.org.uk backslash HE will take you to the health. Um, and 1200 to 1203 is specifically addressing this. And I think 1203, I'm reading out directly, Fighting HIV stigma is vital to curbing new cases of HIV as well as improving the well-being of those living with HIV. Raising awareness and fighting stigma should be a part of compulsory sexual education in schools as well as public awareness campaigns. Um, so I don't think we actually need to, certainly that paragraph of the Policies for Sustainable Society, I think pretty well covers what we might want to say. Um, I think actually looking at the couple of paragraphs before that, they could probably do with a modest updating and for those in the party who are interested in this, it's now actually possible, and sorry, this is very inside baseball, but it's possible for um, policy um, committee to actually minorly update things reflecting changes in the real world. And so that's something I think you could probably take up with policy committee. As a member of the policy development committee, that is something that I can actually take away from this call and implement with PDC um, as soon as we get off it. Obviously, we've got conference coming up at the start of March, so we're a little bit busy with that. But once conference is finished, we're hoping to sit down and, and thrash out like our long term plans for, for the periods that we've been elected. But, but, but I think you know, that I think is very easily fixed. I think on the broader point, um, one of the things that um, you know, it's within the party, we have the policies for a sustainable society. And if you printed them out, you know, they, I don't know how high they would be, but they would come to a very large, large part of paper. Um, but you know, we are also guided by green principles. And, you know, those principles are expressed in the policies for a sustainable society. But what I was saying before about everyone being treated with respect, having the possibility to develop to their full human potential, having the chance for a healthy life, you know, those are things that underpin everything that I do. And I don't need something in the policies for a sustainable society. I don't need a policy statement from conference to use those principles to guide what I'm doing on HIV policy or, or anything else. And so, you know, the, the, the nature sometimes in this area is, you know, we can sometimes see the science, you know, things like home pet testing develop, things change quite quickly. We won't necessarily have every detail in the policy, but if we stick to those principles, which are core green principles, then we know what to do. And, you know, I very seldom find myself in, in, in the House of Lords going, oh, I don't really know what the green reaction to this should be. It's usually very, very obvious. Um, and I think you know, the challenge is always prioritisation. You know, I could 
um, Green Party policy, I sometimes think is unfortunately against cloning because I could clone myself four times and still, you know, not do everything I'd like to do in a day. Um, but you, know, it's very clear this is something we have as Greens always prioritised, have always been le leading edge in as Brighton and Hove Council, you know, is demonstrating again. So I think it's something that we will continue to make a priority. But you know, you can always do more to make sure that we we are talking about it in the house generally, and you know, saying both to the Terence Higgins Trust and the National Age Trust, you know, I'm always here as a, a resource myself and Jenny. You know, I probably tend to lead in this area. Health's my area. Um, you know, uh, we can ask written questions in the house, and this also applies to any green councillors on the call. If you've got a local issue but has a particular national perspective. Um, I can ask the, the government 12 written to questions a week. I don't quite say they have to answer them. They have to provide some text in response, which is not quite the same thing as answering them. But nonetheless, they can be pressured and pushed with things like written questions. Uh, you know, if we're debating things in the House that's relevant, I'm always interested to hear from local councillors, the things that I can raise from local case studies, local examples. So, you know, it's important there are Greens in the room at all levels and we can be in there raising those issues and working together, you know, from the very local level, from a parish councillor to a principal authority councillor through to the House of Lords, Caroline in the, in the Commons as well, we can all work together and that's what we aim to do. Thanks, Anne, that's brilliantly worded. Um, so I think I'm just going to quickly come on to Liam, obviously, as you were saying about the Policy Development Committee. So to kind of like in about 60 seconds, just before we have closing uh, from everyone. Sorry, time pressure. Um, just like kind of describe about the Policy uh, um, Development Committee and how we can kind of like snag things around so they're more up to date to, to obviously where they've been currently and to look at the HIV Commission and how we can use that plus on a local level as well quickly. Of course. Um, so the first thing to do would be to hunt out the policy working group that is specialising in health um, and education. Um, it's to then reach out to them, see if they are functioning as a working group. If not, we can get one set up with an enabling motion. Um, we can bring forward the HIV Commission. We can sit down then and have a look at what our current policy chapter is and what we would like it to be. Um, and we can get something drafted and written and up to next conference within a year. We did it with the drugs policy chapter. We got that rewrote and it's the best drugs policy chapter of any political party out there. Um, so, you know, <laughs> no pressure to Zoe, who I know is on this call from drugs policy working group to uh, work on <laughs> work on the health side next. Thanks, Zoe. <laughs> I'll say that. Got your work cut out, sorry. <laughs> um, so I think kind of like coming into the last couple of minutes really before we before we finish. Um, uh, I think really, just to like say thank you to everyone for, for joining us. Um, I appreciate that everyone's like busy, especially Natalie <laughs> tonight. So thanks for being with us, um, doing two things at once. I can do that just. Um, so I think I just wanna like ask everyone your final thoughts really on what you'd hope to kind of see in the next like few years up to 2025 and obviously up to 2030. I think we can all be in agreement that we all want to see a zero HIV transmission, uh, a reality uh, by 2030. So let me come to uh, let me come to Natalie. Actually, I'll change it around a little bit. Okay. Well, I'm actually just going to throw one more thing into the equation because I don't think I, ha I have heard most, but not quite all of the session. Um, and I do. You know, we're focused tonight on the UK on on the um, and the HIV Commission, but. I do think we have to just take a glance at the international position as well and the tragic situation where we're seeing the UK government planning to slash its internet spending on international development aid. And, you know, some of the remarks I made at the start in terms of um, not just, you know, money, but also to make sure that we're, we're sharing, you know, we are, I'm not sure we're quite absolutely 100% world leading in a way that Boris Johnson would like to claim, but we have got some really good practice in the UK, some really good case studies, some really good examples of the advocacy work that's been done. And it's really important that we make sure that is shared as much as we can. And, you know, even a very practical point, you know, we're now on the, all on this call from the UK, at least I think we are, but, um, uh, you know, we could be from around the world you know, we can now take part in events all around the world. We can contribute to things around the world with a relatively small investment of time and money. 
different to might have been in the past. So I think you, it's really important that we focus on what's happening in the UK, uh, but we also very much need to, to think about doing what we can to share our knowledge, share our experience and fight to keep the international development aid going. It's just something I think in this conversation needs to be thrown in. Thanks. No, I'm, I'm glad you did, actually. Uh, I know we could probably have talked about uh, not just the HIV Commission, but obviously HIV and AIDS all night long, because there is a vast amount of information <laughs> in a very short space of time, um, especially over 40 years. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate that, Natalie. Um, let me come to, uh, to Liam uh, on, your, on your final thoughts. <clears throat> um, so within the next two years, I would really like to see the implementation of inclusive sex and relationship education that, that is ensuring that young people are getting a full and frank age appropriate um, sex and relationship education that's covering STDs, HIV, um, going and getting tested, how easy that is to do and, and breaking that stigma. Um, and also not separating, this is a, a slight aside, not separating gender-based SRE, because I think it's really important for, for a holistic approach to, to that, to understand. Um, and then, you know, taking us up to 2030, I'd really like to see a push for campaigning against um, HIV laws that have stigmatized and criminalized HIV in such a way that that it's specifically focused on HIV. There's there's enough um, laws out there without us having to single out and criminalize HIV um, as as a certain law. But that's 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 a huge topic um, to drop in at the end. Um, but it is it is something that I think we really need to look at because that's a global thing. It's not just a UK based thing. Thanks, Liam. Uh, Deborah. You're on mute. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I want to give a shout out to Liam for talking about HIV criminalisation because I know it's not the topic for today, but just 100% yes to what you just said. Um, and I guess for me, bearing in mind it's very hard to kind of narrow it down, but really it's about absolutely seizing the moment. Like we have an opportunity now that I really don't think we've had in this country for a long time. And the momentum has started and what I want to see is that pressure and that momentum kind of carrying on. You know, we have the opportunity to write, like COVID has really brought home the impact of health inequality and the way in which, you know, public health is often about those who are the most vulnerable in society having the worst health impacts. And that really is the story about HIV. It's often, a, it's, you know, it's an epidemic that is absolutely driven by inequality and it's driven by poverty and it's driven by stigma. And we absolutely have the opportunity to do something about that. So for me, I just wanna feel like we haven't let this opportunity go past and it's not, just doesn't become a little blip. No, absolutely. And, and I think kind of, as you were saying earlier, it's about keeping it at the top of the agenda continuously for the next 10 years, especially in that final push to, to before we just get to, to, to 20, uh, the end of 2030. So yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that, 100%. Um, and, I, and lastly, but not least, I'll, um, I'll come to Ian. Well, just, just very briefly, and first of all, can I, can I say, first of all, thank you so much for organising this event. It really is so important that we uh, have the opportunity to engage with uh, colleagues across the political, political spectrum. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are so grateful for, for that. Um, I mean, next year, it'll be 40 years since Terry Higgins uh, died, um, one of the first people known to have died to die of an AIDS-related illness in the UK. Um, so there's two things that motivate me. One is that it's incredible to think that less than 40 years uh, from the first uh, case in the, in the UK, we're actually talking about ending new HIV transmissions. Who would have thought that uh, even five, 10 years ago? So that's why, um, following on from Deborah's point, let's seize this moment uh, because it, it, it's absolutely within our grasp. Then the other thing that uh, spurs me and motivates me, um, I was 31 when I was diagnosed with HIV back in 1996. Um, and I remember very well that day and I don't want any other young 31 year old to have to go through that again. And so that's what inspires me. That's what motivates me. And I would love you all to join uh, me and us on that journey. Thank you, Ian. That's really poignant, that was. Um, so, yeah, so all, all I kind of want to say, just to finish off, really, I know we've run over a few minutes, so I do apologise to everyone for keeping them 
Um, but I think from my perspective, it's about if you haven't been tested, go and get a test. It is natural, it's HIV testing, but go and get yourself tested um, because there is support out there, there's treatment out there, and you can live a normal and healthy life, uh, a very prolonged life, should I add as well. Um, but I think I kind of want to, to thank everyone for being here this evening. Um, don't forget, if you want to go and help out um, with the HIV Commission, um, please go to their to the website. Um, if you want to help out with Terence Higgins Trust, go to their website or donate to the Terence Higgins Trust as well. And also to, to tap into the National AIDS Trust. If, if you want to go and help out with the National AIDS Trust, as we're a force together, please go and visit the website and also donate to their charity as well. So thank you everyone for being with us this evening. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and I'm hoping this is going to be many more conversations uh, to come. So thank you.